Good morning. Uh, today I'll be talking about solving cold cases uh, by true allele analysis of DNA evidence. So our starting point is the genotype. That's the unit of information uh, that is collected by forensic scientists and analyzed. And, it, and I'm showing a genotype on the left. It's just a list of pairs of numbers. And what's important to keep in mind for both investigations uh, and for databases is that genotypes have no personal information. They're anonymous data. Uh, they're good only for matching. They're not related to disease or genetic predisposition. And they're basically just good for a barcode as identification connecting people to crimes. So when we talk about databases, we're not talking about anything except lists of numbers. How do we get a genotype? We have trillions of cells in our body. And you see on the left that these cells can have uh, nuclei uh, that contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, which are 3 billion letters uh, that are text. Uh, and they're red like text biologically. And if you open up a spot on one of those chromosomes and you take a look, you can read a location at that text. That location is called a locus. And it's the text of that location uh, that begins to form genotypes. So one person has one uh, genotype, and if we take a look at a person on the left and we take a look at a location in the center on one of these chromosomes, we take a close look, we'll see that uh, they have two different varieties or alleles that they inherit, one from each parent. And in forensic identification, the nature of these alleles is length variation. And the reason is uh, when uh, methods like PCR and short and repeats were developed uh, 20 years ago, it was a very uh, easy assay to amplify DNA and look at length variation. And so these are the markers that are used, typically 10 to 20 in, at, at a time on different locations in a chromosome. Uh, so if a person has two different markers, they're heterozygous, you'll see two different lengths, like here, shorter seven, and a longer 14, they can also be the same. The DNA data that's obtained from genetic analyzers after this trace amount of DNA is amplified at one of these 15 loci is very easy with a single source DNA that comes from one person where there's lots of DNA. And here we see two peaks, and they are labeled with a 7 and a 14, and that corresponds to the person's genotype. Uh, at this one locus. Again, it's very simple. Of the 100 possible alleles, allele pair genotype values that somebody could inherit in a population at this location, the data reduces those 100 possibilities down to one, which can produce a lot of information. Uh, this is the DNA identification pathway for single source DNA. We begin on the left with an evidence item. The lab extracts the DNA. They amplify it a million times over, labeling it with fluorescence. And then they separate out uh, by size the DNA molecules that have been amplified. And they detect signals with lasers to form the sort of peaks that you see in the center. That's the evidence data. Uh, and what the data are is that the different alleles are segregated uh, horizontally. 7, 14, and then the heights of those peaks correspond to the quantity of DNA that was present. Ultimately, inferring what the genotype is with single source DNA is really easy. The data just tells you here there's a 7 and a 14 that was obtained from evidence. And then once that's been objectively inferred, a comparison can be made with a known genotype like a 714 uh, to establish whether or not there's a match. In the same way, for cold cases, DNA databases are orig were originally made for single source DNA, where the DNA had blood or some other sample that came from just one person leaving that evidence at a crime scene. So how did the DNA database work? If we start on the bottom right, looking at possible suspects, for example, uh, people in prisons, that's how the CODIS database is built up by the FBI. The combined DNA index system. We take these possible suspects, their single genotypes as an individual, upload them to a reference database, and their genotypes are sitting there. So we'll have a list of maybe 15 numbers like 7, 14, 8, 8, and so on. That's all that's there, lists of numbers. And then on the bottom left, at a crime scene, DNA can be collected and analyzed, 
And again, if it's single source, it's easily determined what that genotype is, what that those lists of pairs of numbers are, and they too can be uploaded to the evidence side of a database as, as genotypes. And so for solving cold cases, evidence from a crime scene is uploaded on the left side of the picture to an evidence database, and then going across the picture, it, it can be matched to reference genotypes. And when those that match occurs, and uh, an individual is identified as a reference from evidence, that gives a major lead uh, in, in solving a cold case. But most DNA evidence is not made of single source DNA. Most of it is DNA mixtures of two or more individuals. And this being Halloween, uh, with a very good production of Macbeth at the Pick Theater. It's the best, most sold out production they ever had. Um, so if you imagine you take two individuals, an eye of a newt, toe of a frog, and you put them together into the cauldron of the DNA mixture, what you have is you've now doubled the DNA and you've doubled the toil and trouble, at least, in trying to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to continue talking about uncertain DNA evidence, which is most of what is found at crime scenes. So now we have two people, and there are at least two genotypes. Mixtures from crime scenes can have three, four, five, six different individuals in them. But let's keep it simple with two. And now I'm adding on the bottom row another individual. And if we look at the same location on the chromosome, and there are two people mixed into this mixture cauldron, and you amplify it, you're going to find that there's probably more than just two alleles. There can be up to four different values of the DNA from the parents of these individuals. And now we have a 7 and a 14 and a 10 and a 12, and they're all in the mix. And when they get amplified and read out as data, we no longer have something that's as simple as one or two peaks. This is what DNA mixture data looks like. It has peak heights. Uh, you see two taller peaks, like a 7 and a 14, two shorter peaks, a 10 and a 12 in the middle. The pattern becomes important. You can see by eye that it might be the case that if there's a 7 and a 14 as an individual that left a lot of their DNA, and in the middle, a 10 and a 12 is an individual who left half the amount of DNA, the pattern matters. So now it's just not a matter of looking at the two tallest peaks. Uh, there's a lot more involved of peak heights, data, patterns, and uncertainty. And the result is <clears throat> that the DNA pathway is broken. Uh, the lab can still generate evidence data, uh, but they no longer can readily infer what the evidence genotype is. In fact, if they were to say that it's a single allele pair out of the 100 possible values, they would be wrong. Uh, because there are multiple possibilities of what the answers can be. And uh, the point here is that in order to solve this problem, you have to separate that mixture into its component genotypes. And if you don't, and most manual methods of interpretation and software programs that are built for this cannot separate the genotypes, then you're always dealing with a complex mixture. You're looking at the cauldron. You're not looking at the newt or the frog. And the result is, if you don't get an evidence genotype shown on the top right, you can't make a comparison, and you can't solve the problem. And in the US right now, there's a DNA mixture crisis that the DNA community in forensics is very well aware of. There have been dozens of articles written about it, uh, dozens of workshops, programs uh, sponsored by the federal government. Uh, by companies, uh, laboratories, and the problem is, is that if a lab can't say with certainty what the answer is, uh, their tendency is not to adopt new technology, but instead to say it's inconclusive. So this means evidence that's been collected from a crime scene, tested in a DNA laboratory, data has been produced from it, and it's made it to the, like to the one yard line is not being converted into information that's of any evidentiary or investigative value to society. There's about 100,000 of them over the last five years. So people develop methods of separating out genotypes from data. Uh, this true allele system, uh, we started on 15 years ago. We spent 
10 years developing it through 25 versions to make it accurate. It's easy to write something in a few hours that gives an answer, but getting the right answer is a little bit harder. And what happens on the right side is if the human interacts with data, it's uploaded to a server shown in the center. You can have anywhere from eight to 80 different processors uh, solving these problems, working out for each evidence item from the, from the data, not from the sample, uh, what the genotypes are, separating out the genotypes, and then writing it back to that central database server very objectively without ever seeing the comparison reference. And then a person later on can combine the evidence information together with the references in order to determine match statistics. So the key here is that true allele separates mixtures into their two, three, four, five, six components, whatever it is. Here, for example, in this two-person mixture, it resolves the mixture data into a major component, about three quarters, a minor component, about one quarter, and that separation into components um, is what uh, permits uh, analysis of data. And so what ends up happening is the DNA pathway is restored, and from that evidence data that we see in the middle that's a mixture, the computer can continue to infer an evidence genotype. And there's a price that you pay for it in that the answer is not just one answer. It may not just be a, a 10-12 or a 10-10 or some particular allele pair at one of these uh, genetic loci. You have a probability distribution. And so now there's a little bit more to explain to a jury. Uh, there's a little bit more to get across. But essentially, instead of having one number, there's a list of numbers with confidences attached to them. And the mathematics of how you produce match statistics doesn't care if it's one number or a probability distribution. So in this way, you can separate out the genotypes at each locus. This would be the minor contributor. And then make comparisons, produce match statistics, and actually uh, preserve the DNA data for use uh, in a fighting crime. So I'd like to tell you about a case that I worked on this year. This one was in England. And this is a rapist in Southampton, which is a port city shown in blue at the very south of the map of England in um, Hampshire or Hampshire County, which is a southern county. This was a stranger rape that occurred on New Year's Eve. A woman was walking home from a friend's house and uh, she was uh, somewhat inebriated at the time and she was attacked by a, an individual who uh, beat her, raped her, left her, and um, she was uh, found by people and brought to the police. And then a rape kit was collected. Uh, the nurses found, uh, they collected a trace amount of semen from vaginal swabs, and this, this was submitted for DNA profiling. And this is taken from the report from uh, the crime lab. Uh, the DNA profile contained limited information, uh, meaning, as you'll see, the peak heights were low and it was uncertain evidence. And so a speculative search was done on their national DNA database in the UK, uh, the NDNAD, and the search came up with 13 profiles. Again, it was a very fuzzy search that was done, but they are allowed to do that in England. And one of them was in the Hampshire County area. And unfortunately, they had gotten to this point, but there was no evidence that was produced because for evidence, you need a match statistic. And this is the sort of language that we see in uh, tens of thousands of reports in the US every year due to the low level and incomplete uh, nature of the DNA profile. It's not suitable for a statistical calculation. Without a statistic, uh, there's no, nobody's going to court and this case can't be resolved. And that's typically uh, when cybernetics gets called in on the service part. We also provide crime labs with computer systems. So the true allele system uses all the data. This is the quantitative pattern at the, the 10 locus kit that they use in England, SGM uh, plus, and this is at the D21 locus. You see a peak at uh, 28 on the left, a little peak at 29, a tall peak at 32.2, uh, they can come in fractions. And so this is the starting point for analysis, but the methods that people use for analysis discard data. In order to simplify the problem, uh, rather than making it into a hundred dimensional statistical problem and trying to solve it with all its complexity, 
Uh, what people do to simplify it, and it often works on simpler data, is they just draw a line that's predetermined by their laboratory. Any of the peaks that are over the line, like here, uh, the 28 and the 32.2, uh, they're considered to be in the list as an allele, and anything under, uh, like the 29, is discarded. Now, the problem here is that if the major contributor is the victim with a 2832.2 as their genotype, then the 29 of the perpetrator is thrown out, this locus isn't used, and that information is lost to criminal justice. Uh, what the true allele computer does, and I describe this at every jury trial, is that it considers every possible genotype solution. Uh, so imagine that the two blue rectangles represent one person's allele pair, maybe the victim's, uh, with a 28 and a 32.2, those two tall rectangles as the pair, and maybe there's a smaller amount of the 29 and the 32.2 shown in orange. If you add together and stack up those different quantities of those alleles from the genotypes, you see that the heights of those added up rectangles give you the same kind of pattern as the data. And so in that case, the computer would confer a higher probability to those genotypes. But it also tries out another 50,000 different possibilities, moving those rectangles all over the place and changing their heights in order to work out what the other possibilities are. So it doesn't just go for what looks like the answer. It tries out everything independently of what the data are comparing to the data and working out a probability distribution of what's possible. Here we see at this one locus for this one contributor, the minor contributor, the one that was in orange, there's a probability distribution of different allele pair possibilities. So these are possibilities are shown on the bottom. Uh, there's like a 28-29 with a 12% probability, a 27-29 followed by a 28-29 with a 14% probability. These are all different possibilities, and what has happened is that the 100 low prob possibility events have been f concentrated in this blue color uh, into what the evidence is trying to say is the genotype of the other person at this one locus. And this is all done objectively. The computer at this point has never seen who it's comparing with. It doesn't know who the suspects are. It doesn't know about uh, the 13 profiles from the database. It just knows this is what the genotype is as more concentrated information. At this point, a comparison can be made to, for a match statistic. Suppose that the person of interest uh, shown on the right has a 29.32.2 genotype. Um, that's indicated with, with a red rectangle. We can answer the question, how much more does the suspect with his genotype at the 29.32.2 shown on the right, on the right, match the evidence than a random person does? Well, random is shown in brown. That's, those are the chances that a person in the British Caucasian population would have each of these genotypes, and there are a hundred of them. I'm only showing uh, the eight that are corresponding to the blue bars from the evidence that we saw in the last slide. And then all a match statistic is, is it looks at the change in probability from random up or down, because it could go either way with evidence in favor or against, to what the evidence genotype is that's been inferred by the computer shown in blue. And that ratio of blue to brown the probability after seeing the data divided by probability before the data is telling us mathematically that here there was a five-fold change in probability from 5% up to 21%. That five is the match statistic at this locus. And looking at all 10 loci from left to right, that axis is the match statistic called a likelihood ratio or an LR. And then Vertically, what you're seeing are the 10 different loci, and the bars are showing the magnitude of the match statistic. Uh, some of the numbers are a little bit larger, and, and some of the numbers, if you look on the bottom left where the scale's one, uh, some of the loci are giving some evidence against the person being in. It's not up to us uh, to pick and choose the loci. Objectively, 
you need to combine all the evidence, all the match information, in this case from all 10 loci, to produce a final match statistic. And in this case, that lets us ask the question, is the suspect in the evidence? And what we can say, using the language of single source DNA, because the computer has separated out genotypes, even though there's probabilities, once the genotypes have been separated into a first contributor, a second contributor, third contributor, now all the simplicity of single source DNA comes back to us. And we can say that a match between the vaginal swabs and Stuart Ashley Burton is 17,000 times more probable than coincidence. That's the match statistic. Now there's a result. So in this case, I happened to be in England at a conference. I met with the investigators and the barrister who was prosecuting the case, and we were preparing. Uh, but based on uh, a number of factors, according to the investigators, including the fact that there was solid DNA evidence, uh, Mr. Burton uh, pleaded guilty to the rape that happened on New Year's Day morning, and he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Now, I want to say a few words about database hits. So what happened in England is not happening here. In England, they can take an uncertain profile and they routinely can scan it and come back with many genotypes. A profile and a genotype here mean the same thing. Just looking at the numbers, what I'm showing here on the x-axis are the 13 different individuals that were found on the, on the database and the vertical axis is showing the match statistic represented as the number of zeros. It's called the log of the LR, the logarithm to likelihood ratio. The number of zeros in the match statistic is the main way of representing information in forensic science and many other areas of information science. So in this case, a three is a one followed by three zeros is a thousand, a one followed by six zeros or a log of six um, is a million. And in our case, it was roughly a one followed by four zeros. The number was in the tens of thousands. The first thing that we see qualitatively is that Mr. Burton, shown in green, his statistics all the way on the right, his value over four is well separated from the match statistics, the likelihood ratios uh, that were under two zeros or 100. So 10,000 was different from these numbers that were 100 or less. And so that was useful, but with computers, we can do more. What happens is that one can ask from the evidence genotype that was inferred from the rape kit, what is the distribution of non-contributors? What does that look like? And the answer is you'll get a bell curve of what the match statistics are, the number of zeros in the match statistic, the log LR, of the information. And in this case, the bell curve was centered at around negative three and didn't go out much past two. And so we could work out what was the chance for each of the 12 uh, cold hit genotypes that were found on the British database of having a match statistic that was inclusionary, even if they actually were not included, they were not a contributor, but there was a false hit. And it turned out that that probability the rarity was less than um, uh, one in a thousand, they weren't very likely. But by looking at the bell curve, what we could see is that Mr. Burton's match statistic of 10,000 was far beyond that range. And in fact, there was less than a one in a million chance that that was a false hit. So in this case, it wasn't just that the match statistic was 10,000, we could look at the evidence and, and separate out the 13 contributors and determine that statistically the 12 who weren't likely had a very low chance of being uh, included in that mixture, whereas Mr. Burton, with his statistic in the tens of thousands, it was less than a one in a million chance that it was the wrong guy. And that was very helpful in this report. So why do we rely on true allele? I'm not going to go into a lot of pictures and math and statistics. I thought about it, but then, you know, uh, so I'll just tell you that there have been seven published validation papers, two are coming out next year, that look at to what extent is this computer interpretation of DNA evidence reliable. Uh, the first four are done on data of known composition generated in the laboratory. The bottom three are done on actual casework, uh, whether uh, looking at uh, maybe 50 different cases and understanding 
uh, how tr what Trulial did and how it compared with human review. The main axes of validation are threefold. The first is if somebody really contributed to their, their DNA to a mixture or to DNA evidence, is the computer finding a positive match statistic? Is the number like a thousand or a million or a trillion? The second component is with non-contributors. If someone didn't contribute their DNA to the mixture, is the computer correctly excluding them, giving a number like one in a million or one in a trillion? In fact, on average, it's more like one in a billion or actually one in a billion billion exclusionary power. So there's a separation between people who are contributors and their larger positive match statistics and people who are not contributors and their negative match statistics to separate those out. And the other question is reproducible. Uh, reproducibility, if you run the program uh, multiple times since you need random search to solve these hundred dimensional problems, do you get the same answer? And the answer is yes, uh, usually within a factor of two or 10, depending on the data. So the system is very highly re validated uh, for its reliability. And you may ask, well, isn't all DNA evidence reliable? The answer is no. Uh, the, the data itself is highly reliable, but the interpretation is not. And rather than showing you our studies, let me show you some studies by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, uh, which conducts studies on mixtures and has been doing so for 10 years and warning the forensic science community about the unreliability of its mixture interpretation. This is a slide prepared by Dr. John Butler at NIST uh, from 2005. It's the MIX 05 study, Mixtures 2005. And what he showed was that when data was sent out as two person mixtures to about 100 crime labs across the country, many of the crime labs said they couldn't interpret it at all. But at the labs that did interpret it and did provide a DNA match statistic, it was all over the place. And here we see from Dr. Butler's slide, there are match statistics in the tens of thousands, which is four zeros after the one, up to a match statistic of hundreds of trillions, which is 14 zeros after the ones. That's a 10 order of magnitude range from four zeros up to 14 zeros all on the same data from different crime labs. So clearly, there wasn't a lot of consistency in the community. To try to deal with this, uh, a second higher threshold called a stochastic threshold was introduced. And the main result of it uh, was that almost no DNA evidence that was meaningful was produced. I left out all the statistical slides on this. But you can imagine uh, that mixtures were now not being reported and the average match statistic in some studies was now a hundred whereas before uh, it might have been a million or depending on the method used a trillion so how well did adding another threshold work at the cost of throwing out all this data not very well this was a more recent study from nist presented this year by uh, dr michael Kobel, uh, the mixture 13 study and here he measured in one of the mixtures, this is a three person mixture, a hundred laboratories participated. And the question is, are there false inclusions? And what he found was in this data that was sent out to a hundred laboratories in the US, if you look at the bottom row, 70 of the laboratories falsely included a third contributor and provided a match statistic of what the strength of inclusion was. So most of the labs given data like this may be producing false inclusions. 25% of the labs gave no answers at all, and um, six of them did give an exclusion. And in this slide uh, from NIST, one of them uh, was a computer program that produced a negative match statistic, and that was Trulil. Uh, NIST has been doing more studies. This is from a, a talk that I saw in Holland presented by uh, the Netherlands Forensic Institute. It was a collaborative study with the US. Uh, and uh, this is what he showed in August. If you, if you look all the way on the left for simple two-person mixtures with a 10% minor contributor, which is what we see a lot of in casework, there were four different methods with one nanogram of DNA, standard amount of DNA, and they all produced match statistics. Numbers up around 12 mean a trillion, Numbers down around six mean a million, a one followed by six zeros. 
as the amount of DNA was halved in the middle slide to half an anagram, these software programs that use thresholds that tried to add one parameter to assess the amount of dropout are not working anymore. The average match statistic is moving down to zero, which means no information, a match statistic of one. And when you move all the way to the right by having the amount of DNA again, to the sort of low template DNA that we see all the time uh, from touch surfaces, bullets, and so on, or even in that rape case that I described, uh, software that's trying to make simplifying assumptions with thresholds and dropout is again producing no information. But if you do extensive computer modeling, let the computer take six hours to solve it, have hundreds of variables, work out the variation, I'm not going to go into what all those variables are, in order to determine the genotype, uh, like true allele does, uh, then you can preserve identification information on the same data and produce match statistics uh, that in this case were between uh, a million and a billion. So these are not my studies. That's just what's happening. So that means the current methods that labs are using and the ones that many of them are moving to don't work. They don't find information and they may be falsely including people. So uh, true allele was first used in 2009 in a court case uh, out in about an hour east of here in Indiana County. Uh, Cyril Wecht uh, participated in that case. This was the Kevin James Foley case. Uh, he was the state trooper who was convicted of murdering John Yelenick, who was a dentist. Um, there's a lot been written about it, and I think it's even described in Cyril's new book. But as a result of, of that case, there was a, a miscibility challenge, and a true allele was admitted into evidence after challenge, used at trial, and uh, Trooper Foley was sentenced to life in prison. There was an appeal, and as a result of the appeal, uh, there was a Pennsylvania precedent that was set by the appellate court. And so True Allele enjoys statewide precedent in Pennsylvania. There's also been admissibility challenges that were sex successfully overcome in California, Virginia, and most recently a few weeks ago in Ohio. Uh, True allele is used a lot in Allegheny County. There was a local rape case of a serial rapist uh, where the lab statistic was understandably under a million using the methods that they used. True allele could separate out the genotypes uh, and produce a match statistic in this case of over a quadrillion. That's 15 zeros after the one. And uh, Mr. Ralph Scundrich was sentenced to 75 to 150 years uh, for that rape. Uh, here are some more cases uh, where true allele has been used in Allegheny County. Uh, we've uh, worked on over 25 cases, mainly for the district attorney's office. Uh, we filed over 20 reports. Most of them are plea bargains, and uh, four of them have gone to trial. There was also an exoneration. So it's widely used in our county. It's also used across the U.S. We've written uh, hundreds of, uh, of reports and the, either the laboratory systems are being used by labs or case reports have been filed and used by law enforcement or by the defense community. We've done about 15 defense cases, mainly innocence projects, uh, in about half the states in the U.S. We also have done work overseas uh, in you know, Europe and Australia. I'd like to tell you about a cold case homicide in Canada that we've been involved in. The text is taken, uh, abstracted from a newspaper article last summer from the Hamilton Spectator called New DNA Skills May Solve Hamilton Killing. And so the article describes that cybergenetics examined the DNA data uh, that was generated by the crime lab uh, from this Hamilton uh, stabbing scene. Uh, Hamilton is about a, uh, an hour southeast of Toronto, uh, separating out genetic profiles of the killers. So. The news media has it right, right? We separate out the genetic profiles. That's exactly what's happening. But the crime lab, quote, is not permitted to enter DNA analysis from other labs into the national DNA database. That's the norm. A lab can only use its own methods most of the time, unless there's a court order otherwise, to do solve cold cases and from DNA. And this frustrates prosecutors, investigators, uh, innocence Project, defense attorneys, 
um, I've spoken with Ken Maines about this. Uh, there isn't anybody involved in criminal justice who, who doesn't understand why evidence that you have can't be used to search a database. And this was summed up nicely uh, by the victim's stepmother uh, who said uh, she was baffled as to why the DNA profile can't be run to the Canadian database. If we can use it, let's use it, she said, frustrated. And so what this means actually is that laboratories stick with older technologies. The benefits of all this police work and cold uh, case solution isn't being conferred on society because if they don't use a new method themselves, uh, they have the choice to not do the search and it usually would take a court order to overcome that. Uh, in this case, uh, they had suspects, comparison uh, was made and an arrest was made in this case uh, at the end of last year. So at some level, uh, our DNA databases are broken. And why is that? Because they don't separate out mixtures into genotypes. Instead, they, what the crime labs do following uh, federal protocols is they produce lists of alleles that may be accurate or not accurate. And these lists of alleles, as we saw in the England case, can produce many potential genotypes on the reference side. Uh, in this case, uh, the reference side in the U.S. is the CODIS database that has 11 million convicted offenders in it who are used as likely suspects in order to solve cases. So when evidence comes from a crime scene, uh, what's the problem? The problem is that middle arrow that says match. And the issue is, is that if evidence, which is just lists of alleles and not actual separated genotypes, are compared against the database, they may come back with 10, 100, or 1,000 profiles, different genotypes of potential suspects with no statistical way, if they're using older methods, of resolving them. That can generate a lot of police work. So there are rules in place that essentially say that if the, the specificity of your DNA mixture isn't less than the size of the database, if your match statistic isn't at least 10 million, you can't upload it. And the result is less than 10% of mixture evidence is ever uploaded to our national DNA database. Again, for all this work that's being done on cold cases, the, the files are analyzed, the, the evidence is obtained, the DNA is tested, money's found for that, and the data is produced, almost none of it is being uploaded. That includes live cases as well. So our CODIS database is excellent with easy data that's single source, but most of the data today is mixtures, and virtually none of it is being used to help identify criminals. So what's the solution? The solution is to use better science and actually separate out the genotypes. And once the genotypes, as shown on the bottom left, are separated, they can be uploaded as probability distributions, but as separated genotypes, to an evidence database of genotypes. That means 100% of the evidence can make it onto a DNA database. Um, and then be compared against references. Uh, the only issue with comparing references is that if a crime lab chooses to not make those comparisons, then the technology solving the left part of the equation, which is how to get useful evidence, but the right side of the equation is still owned by government and may not be available for comparison. Uh, there are some groups that are taking advantage of both sides of this equation, uploading the evidence and having the reference samples. Kern County in California uh, uh, jointly authored an article with me in last month's Forensic Magazine, which is available online, about how Kern County resolves the DNA mixture crisis. And what they've done is they have a true allele system in-house uh, where they're working both current cases as well as going backwards in time over uh, five to 10,000 older DNA cases where they have the data. And the way they run their lab is that all the DNA data is processed automatically by computer. It takes them a few minutes to ask the computer, solve everything up to a three-person mixture. It gets uploaded into, into their machine as questions, their, their true allele computer system has 16 processors, and it just separates out the mixtures, uploads it to their database. And then comparisons are made 
of evidence to evidence to solve case to case problems like cold cases, as well as solving evidence to reference of the known references from current and past cases. And the result is that their starting point in their workflow is a match, a statistical match with a likelihood ratio computed, which is what modern genotyping databases can do, but the existing government databases can't. And then they can look at it and say, well, the computer gave us a match. It gave us a positive identification between this item of evidence and this person. Maybe it's in the same case. Maybe it's in a different case. Regardless, their starting point before they do the hard work of reviewing the data is knowing the answer from the very beginning. It's an interesting article, and that's their workflow, and it shows how more powerful science can be used in everyday laboratories uh, to solve current and cold cases. So I'd like to uh, talk in the remaining time about how crime can be prevented by having better DNA databases. And specifically, I'd like to talk about preventing rape by DNA monitoring. And this is based on the concept that all DNA is being processed, all DNA is being uploaded to databases, and that accurate results are being produced. So, and uh, my focus here is going to be rape on college campuses, but the same concept applies to any closed population, including rape in the military, um, as well as prison rape, the same concept. And the idea is basically, as Dan Ariely has written about the honest truth about dishonesty, the main deterrent to dishonesty or crime in many cases is knowing that there's a high certainty you're going to be caught. Right now, there isn't a high certainty that a serial rapist is going to be caught if DNA evidence isn't being tested and when it's tested, it isn't being analyzed and when it's analyzed, it isn't being uploaded. But suppose that weren't the case. And so the idea is to introduce this deterrent effect um, by having Trulial Computing doing genetic surveillance for deterring rape on a college campus. So let's start. Step one, we collect DNA from people. Again, these DNA databases are anonymized. The database itself has no knowledge of the people. Uh, that's how it's usually run. Uh, they're just lists of numbers. That can be, names can be kept elsewhere by a campus police. Uh, but imagine if your goal is really to prevent campus rape, uh, that everybody in the university, uh, because the likely perpetrators are also part of the community, it, certainly in the cases uh, I've seen and others have seen, are profiled and their single source DNA is uploaded onto a genotype database. Say everybody at Duquesne University you know, has their DNA, DNA profiles uploaded to the reference part of a DNA database. Now, a key idea is, is to collect DNA from all rapes. In many situations, particularly in the military, victims won't come forward for fear of reprisals, and that may also be true on campuses. But the idea is that if you have a good DNA database, the victim doesn't have to name anybody. Uh, it's just that the crime has to be reported, a rape kit must be collected, and now, without naming anyone, you have a rape kit. So that's step two, is gather all the evidence, don't only work on five or 10 percent of the cases. Now you want rapid processing of rape kits, whether it's done in conjunction with the local crime lab or with a private uh, DNA vendor. There, there are a number of companies that produce excellent data. Uh, we don't, we're not involved with this step, uh, but there are companies like Sorensen, Bodie, and Selmark that can uh, rapidly take rape kit swabs and transform them into electronic data, as you've, as you've seen. Um, typically, there are 15 different loci and they're mixture data that looks like this. They would minimally contain um, the victim. They would contain the uh, attacker. They may contain other people as well, like consensual partners. That's not a problem if the technology uh, can then accurately interpret the DNA by separating out the mixture into the genotypes, into the profiles of each of the contributors to the rape kit. And that's what you need for accuracy in the match statistics to maintain uh, the, the weight of evidence. The DNA is separated out into individual contributors. So 
once it's separated out, it can then be uploaded to a genotype database using an old fashioned allele type database that CODIS and government labs use won't work. But if you have a genotype database that can represent the genotype of each contributor to the mixture and understand how to represent probability, that's instantaneous, like they're doing at Kern County. Their computers in California separate out these mixtures, upload them to their databases. And now, 100% of the rape kits can be uploaded to a database, not less than 10%. All the information can be preserved. So once that's all uploaded, then a comparison can be made. And in uh, the California system, every 10 or 15 minutes, comparisons made of, in this case, of evidence samples, uh, evidence genotypes on the database to reference genotypes on the database. And then if there's a match, and how is the match determined? It's not by asking, is there some association between uh, the lists of alleles? What's actually happening is a match statistic, a likelihood ratio is being calculated, and any positive match is being notified to who's ever the police or the crime lab who's operating this database. And so that's signaled. And then the individual can be identified, uh, the rapist can be found, and moreover, all of the evidentiary material that you need, the match statistics, the chain of custody, everything is in place for a prosecution. And now you want to ask, if you know you're going to be caught, isn't that going to be a deterrent? And the current technology in place and the system that we have is not a deterrent because people are generally not caught. It's the data just isn't being used, even if it gets collected. But if you're a victim and you know that that data will be used and the perpetrator will be caught, you'll be more likely to come forward. And if you're a perpetrator, you'll be less likely to uh, commit a crime in the first place. And that's the concept of using more advanced technology to separate genotypes and using databases to prevent rape, not just deal with it after the fact. So it's a diverse audience. And um, as John Paul Page's mother said, if we can use it, let's use it. So how can you help? What is it that you can do? If you're the victim of a crime, uh, there's more powerful DNA technology than there used to be. It pays to come forward uh, and have DNA collected. There's a lot more that can be done. If you're not reporting the crime, then you're not helping to seek the resolution of your own crime or that of other crimes. If you're a nurse, you, you need to know how powerful DNA evidence can actually be. There are myths that, oh, within three days, after three days, we can't use DNA anymore. That's completely wrong. There's newer studies that, those are based on studies before modern DNA testing. Uh, people have done studies showing that there's detectable DNA going out to 10 days or even 14 days from rape kits. Uh, and you need to know that. Why would you not uh, collect that information? You also need to know as a nurse that there's a lot of other DNA present, in, for example, in a sexual assault. Uh, there are bite marks, there's clothing. So many of the cases we work on, the key evidence came from clothing, a shirt, underwear, and all of this is useful evidence. There may not be anything in a vaginal swab. Uh, investigators, police or otherwise, need to be aware of what can be done with the DNA. Perhaps the most important thing you need to know is when your DNA, is when your crime lab comes back and tells you it was inconclusive. Take a look at the data. If you see there's actually peaks there, try to find out if there's a, a better method, whether it's ours or someone else's, that can interpret the evidence and give an answer when the crime lab's not willing to testify. Uh, we've had several cases this year of child rapes and uh, horrific cases with children raped weekly from uh, young girls from age seven to every week until they were 14 and they got old enough to uh, tell people about uh, their father. And in some cases, they're not even believed by their mother. But in cases where there's a family rape, many crime labs will simply say, well, these people are related. I can't say anything about people who are related in a mixture. Well, that's silly with modern technology. So truly in those cases separates out those relatives and produces match statistics typically with 15 zeros in the quadrillions. If, if the crime lab is using methods that can't separate out genotypes, of course they can't give an answer. 
but there's much better methods and the data is there. We get calls from uh, police regularly uh, who've learned more about uh, these sorts of methods. If you're a forensic scientist, I think the most important thing you can do is just question everything. Just because somebody hands you a protocol and says, be a good technician, doesn't mean that it makes any sense or that you're actually helping society. Society views the crime lab as an information producer, right? The courts, prosecutors, defense attorneys, police, everyone relies on the crime lab as an information producer, producing match statistics, producing identifications. That's not what, how crime labs view themselves. Uh, and with some of the new NIST policies coming down, uh, there's, a, there's a, a drive to make crime labs just function as technicians uh, without actually thinking about evidence. And that's probably not good, particularly if you're starting out and you can think about it. So I would suggest you question everything and think, does this make scientific sense? What are the best methods? Read widely, attend workshops, and so on. Uh, prosecutors uh, obviously make better use of more informative methods of interpreting evidence, even when crime labs can't. And defense attorney, attorneys do that as well. Uh, there's a lot of exculpatory evidence that's in DNA. Uh, and sometimes it may not even appear exculpatory. Uh, a crime lab will say, this is uninformative. I can tell you the victim's in there, but I can't tell you about anybody else. With modern computing, you can establish that certain people are not in there, like the person who's been in prison for the last 20 years, because there's a number, like one in 100 million, he's not in there. And yet the technology can also establish that there's another contributor who is in there. And the expected match statistic might be a billion. And this is not what most crime labs do, uh, but it's a vast amount of potentially exculpatory evidence in current and in past cases. And I think uh, the general public, it's hard to know what's going on inside of a technical field, but if you look at what's on NIST's website, if you look at, uh, at what's in some of the forensic magazines, and again, most people are interested in this, you'll see that there's really a, a DNA crisis right now. There's 100,000 mixture items that are being ignored as uninterpretable that are very interpretable using better methods. And there's a lot of evidence that just isn't being used. Uh, the culture of forensic science is one of definiteness. Somebody testifying in court would much rather say, I know with absolute certainty that I see a match here. And the notion of bringing in 21st century statistics to say, well, I know that there's a statistical match based on how a computer has separated out a mixture is a new idea to society. And it's uh, sort of alien. You sort of assume that crime labs do everything they can do, right? If they can use it, then they're using it. And that's certainly not the case with DNA mixtures. So if you'd like more information, there's magazine articles and general book chapters uh, on our website. There's a lot of very technical information you're never gonna look at there as well. There's some uh, talks, uh, nar many narrated PowerPoints that introduce general ideas. Uh, if you're interested, I think perhaps the best uh, book chapter on our website in our publication section would be the story of the slaying of the Blairsville dentist, uh, John Yelenick, uh, where Cyril and I were both involved in that case. It tells the story uh, from the collection of evidence, what the FBI was able to do, where they stopped with their interpretation, how we were able to pick up the ball and take it forward and all work together as a team to uh, obtain uh, a conviction on a small amount of DNA that was 7% of a mixture under the victim's fingernails and was actually the only physical evidence in that crime. Okay, well, thank you very much.